Welcome to the California Master Plan for Aging Stakeholder Advisory Thank Committee you. meeting. My name is Amelia Burns and I'm the project director for the Master Plan for Aging. So this is our first meeting since the stay at home orders and also our first entirely virtual meeting as today we are convening via telephone and webinar only. So thank you for logging on or dialing in to join us this morning. Next slide. All right, as I said, today's meeting is hosted by phone and webinar only, and we're offering closed captioning. You can click on the closed captioning button on the screen to activate that feature. And the transcripts from today's call will be made available on our webpage following the meeting. Next slide. There will be opportunities for public comment during this call, and we will share the slide with instructions on how to make public comment again at 1010 per the agenda. And I'm now going to hand it over to California Health and Human Services, Dr. Mark Galley, for opening remarks. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Um, so first, thank you all for joining. I see that we have uh, going up and down, but just over 200 participants, which is uh, pretty incredible. Grateful that everybody uh, is joining us. I think uh, for many of us, this is a uh, important moment when we begin to uh, restart some of the uh, major initiatives and efforts that we uh, were looking forward to at the end of last year and the beginning of this year and really poised in California to take enormous leaps forward uh, through some of the opportunities in the budget and our various efforts. And um, as we continue in our, uh, in our pursuit to do the best we can as a state with COVID-19 uh, around us and, and the threats uh, of that virus and, and its ability to um, really uh, wreak havoc on our communities uh, and our most vulnerable, including, including older Californians, I think this moment signifies to me an opportunity to keep looking forward to how we uh, use, use COVID-19 and the, the tragedies and the uh, situation really for a future of opportunity. And I think what we have uh, uh, done at the agency and with our many departments is become more laser focused on certain aspects of how we protect vulnerable populations and although we always have a long way to go and we're always trying to do better i think there's been some momentous uh uh achievements uh with our focus and and i will say i think our uh relationship and focus on skilled nursing facilities has uh, continued to increase, I think, our um, ability to create programs to support individuals, uh, older individuals and all, all of our vulnerable populations who are sheltering in place in their homes um, has been tremendous. And I think just the creative energy among many of you on the call with our state and local leaders have uh, really given us a, sort of a substrate to move forward and work on. I think just recently, our focus on increasing testing among our skilled nursing facilities, which will soon extend to other congregate care facilities, is a, a very big step in the right direction. Um, our ability to relook at some of the options for um, uh, long-term supports in home instead of just in nursing home facilities for those who are eligible for skilled nursing uh, level care. I think that the start of that conversation is, is a very important one, but I don't want to at all ignore the fact that we are also struggling through and figuring out how uh, we continue to maintain our values and our focus on many of the most important things to all of us while facing enormous budget cuts and a budget forecast that, uh, uh, you know, not that others haven't seen it before or dealt with this before, but I think the, uh, the rapidity by which we're facing it is unusual and unique. 
and um, some of the choices in front of all of us, um, you, you know, whether it's in the legislature, the governor's um, office, or other parts of our state and local governments that depend on uh, funding, uh, state and local funding to promote programs and support our safety net. Uh, there's a lot of tough choices, and I know that this group um, is going to be deeply engaged on some of the proposals and, and um, helping uh, make comments and wade through that. And, and I know I've participated in some of that already, and uh, I've learned a lot in those conversations already, but also um, continue to face the gravity by which these, these decisions are going to have to be made. I'll also say that um, uh, many of you have reached out to the governor governor's office, the governor directly through letters and phone calls and and uh, despite his very busy and complex schedule, uh, Fig who's on the phone call as well or on the Zoom, um, Kim and myself working with other leaders in the governor's office and the governor himself are trying to lock down a time uh, in his schedule to be able to have a conversation with a group of you because we know that that's important and um, just like other groups are reaching out uh, his his commitment to this effort in the master plan for aging um, and really looking across not just our uh, financial resources how they invest in the well-being of older Californians but some of um, some of the other assets that we have uh, uh, sort of moving forward um, and how we align those and bring those together despite sort of having so many dreams deferred because of this budget problem how do we continue to innovate and use the crisis of COVID to do some of the things that we know are gonna be important transformations? How do we do those now? Um, and I'll just wrap up by saying, you know, despite all the focus on COVID, I received an email last night that I'd sort of not been dreading because I've expected it, but um, we got our first notice of a potential um, power shutoff event in the Northern <laughs> part of the state. And yeah. so we sort of move this forward and think about uh, uh, trying to uh, stay focused on protecting vulnerable populations uh, in the face of COVID-19 and this budget. Um, I'm just reminded that we don't get a break from the other parts of our great state that we contend with on an annual basis. And those are coming. So. Um, I implore all of us to, you, you know, certainly continue to think how we put these things together in a meaningful way to protect as many people for as long as we can, and not just protect them, but hopefully support them in thriving, um, despite some of the hard conditions that I think we're all facing um, at this moment. So I look forward to this dialogue. I'm grateful to know that you all are meeting and that him will, um, the, the one thing that is certain to me, having now worked even closer with Kim McCoy Wade, is that her resolve to keep this effort moving and work with each of you is greater than ever. And I'm looking forward to her leadership manifesting in great work with all of you on both planning and implementation of things that will make a meaningful difference for the folks on this call, but also the millions of others that we all work for and with every single day. So with that, Kim, I'll turn it back to you. Um, and uh, again, just grateful for everyone's participation. Thank you, Secretary Galley. Uh, we are gonna also hear from Richard Figueroa, who I believe your line is unmuted. Can you hear me, Kim? Yes. Okay, great. Um, hello, folks. Just just to kind of chime in on a few things that, that Mark said, I just, again, you know, wanna thank you for all of your efforts on helping and helping us meet the you know the pandemic um this has obviously had a massive impact on everybody but particularly um you know our more vulnerable populations and and just seeing kind of the people's willingness to kind of you know dive in and uh, you know both on an individual efforts your efforts as organizations efforts to you know assist the state and the many things that we've tried to do to assist um vulnerable populations including our older californians has just been you know, tremendous. Um, and, and again, you've been responding both with a sense of urgency and innovation at the same time. Um, as the Secretary indicated, you know, this has been a time of tremendous challenge, um, uh, you know, in terms of its impact on programs and 
impact everybody, you know, psychologically, economically, financially, just in every every other kind of way. Um, and so, you know, again, we appreciate your your patience and diligence in working with us as we work through we work through these things. Obviously, this is not what you know. The, we obviously entered in January in a whole different mode um, in terms of our you know our, our budget preparations and budget expectations. As you know, and have had to drastically um, um, curtail. Um, pretty much all of our aspirations, at least in the short term. But I think that, that you know, just kind of reaffirm what maybe I think that was appropriate term, dreams deferred, maybe I think as the secretary said, that, you know, this is a master plan. It is over a long term. This will, you know, we will get past this. Um, you know, obviously we hope for additional assistance from the federal government to kind of help us get there and, and get out of this a little bit quicker than we would otherwise. But we do appreciate and want to continue to work on a forward-looking document that does kind of identify those aspirations and goals. Um, you know, obviously, in the light of COVID, maybe there are other things that we would change or additions we would make or things that we've tried out that, that have worked or haven't worked that would help inform um, inform this decision. But again, we're very committed to the, the master plan process and appreciate your continuing, um, um, you know, work on it. The governor does look forward to seeing um, the results, and as Mark indicated earlier, are trying to work through the logistics of trying to set up a meeting um, so we can kind of continue the, the, the conversation. And then, you know, again, I'll be listening today, obviously, to, you know, public and, and feedback from the stakeholder advisory committee a, a, as well. But, um, you know, again, just want to chime in from the governor's office, our, our obviously continued commitment to the master plan process and, and, and your work. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Kim. Big. Yes, thank you very much. And thanks for your time this morning being with us. Um, Amanda, can you do the, Amanda Lawrence, who's the project manager at the Department of Aging, can you do the roll call of our uh, stakeholder advisory committee members? Yes, I'll start by reading off the names that we have here on the panelists um, to join via webinar. So we have Andy Imprado, Berenice Nunez, Brandy Wolf, Bruce Chernoff, Cheryl Brown, Craig Cornett, David Lindemann, Debbie Toth, Donna Benton, Heather Young, Jan Arbuckle, Janie Castillo, Jeannie Parker Martin, Jody Reed, Judy Thomas, Kevin Pendle, Christine Bass Hamilton, Laura Karstensen, Leandra Clark Harvey, Marty Lynch, Maya Altman, Mercedes Kerr, Nancy Fisher, Nina Weiler, Rigo Saborio, Shelley Lyford, Shereen McSpadden, Susan DeMorris. And that was everyone we have logged in through webinar. If I missed anyone and you've called in via the phone and you are a stakeholder advisory committee member, could you um, press star nine to raise your hand? This is Fernando Torres Gill as well. Hi, Fernando, thank you. And Peter Hansel, thank you. Peter. Um, Bruce Roberts. This is the Anna Swartz. I'm calling for Paul Van Doren from Community Community Access Center. Thank you. Maria, do we have anyone else? I, I don't think so. We have a couple of folks raising their hands. Um, thank you so much, but I, I don't think they're SAC committee members. Uh, we do have one more. Christina Mills is trying to get in. There's Christina. If you are a SAC member and you are not able to be um, identify yourself, please, um, uh, what, what's best for you, Amanda? If they could go ahead and actually, I think you can email me and I can announce that you're here in a little while. Okay. I think we have everybody. 
Thank you to all of you as we are uh, moving to this new technology, our first all virtual meeting and trying to be transparent and inclusive and efficient. So we will no doubt have lessons learned from this meeting and move forward. I wanna welcome, uh, yes, the uh, full stakeholder advisory committee as well as the uh, 222 attendees. This is Kim McCoy Wade, the director of the California Department of Aging. I'm especially pleased, next slide, to welcome two new members to our SAC. Uh, um, We'll talk about the agenda in just a second, but Andy Imperato, who's the Executive Director of Disability Rights California, is taking the seat that was previously held by Catherine Black uh, Blakemore, who was the Executive Director at DRC. We are um, both so grateful to Catherine for her service and also glad that she um, will be continuing to serve on the Long-Term Services and Support Subcommittee. Um, oh, and I just learned how to undo my video. Hello, everybody <laughs> from the Bay Area. Um, so thank you to Andy and to Catherine for the teamwork. And then we are also happy uh, to have Shireen McSpadden join us, who is the Executive Director of uh, the Department of Disability and Aging Services, the City and County of San Francisco. Uh, welcome. Andy or Shireen, would either of you like to say a word? This is Andy. I'm just grateful for the opportunity to serve, and I look forward to the meeting. Thank you. And is Shireen here? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, we will try to find Shireen too and make sure that she's able to both um, hear and speak. Um, thank you. If we could go back just one second so we can talk about what we're going to do today. We really are going to do one thing, which is hear from all of you about the way forward with the master plan. We want to listen to the stakeholder committee for about an hour, the discussion of all the things that are happening, uh, and also the public comment for at least 20 minutes of public comment. Uh, I'll do a little bit of table setting just to kind of uh, literally set the table about where things uh, are both operationally and uh, much more importantly, uh, meeting the moment. Um, but we'll really spend most of our time on that discussion. Before we did that, if we could go a couple slides, we wanted to just really take a, a pause as we paused the master plan two months ago when COVID came home uh, to just acknowledge the enormity of the moment and the response that the people on this committee and, and the people you serve uh, have, have, have dedicated and committed the past uh, three months um, more than ever. Of course, we always wanna make sure that the public knows about all the resources that are available to older adults, people with disabilities, caregivers, families, communities, and encourage you to go to, to our site for fact sheets and helpful phone numbers and data. But we wanted to start um, really hearing from the Stakeholder Advisory Committee uh, and the stories of their COVID-19 experience uh, to date. We've asked four of our SAC members to share just a couple minutes of reflections on the moment, on their experience. Uh, and so if we can go to the next slide and have Maya, Jenny, Rigo, and uh, Dr. Fernando Torres-Gill all share with us, we'd be so grateful. And we have you in alphabetical order if that's okay. Is Maya here? Uh, yes, I am. Can you hear me? We can. We can't see you, but we can hear you, which is wonderful. Okay. Uh, I mean, I can turn on my video too. If you, um, That'd be great. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to, uh, to share some reflections with you today. Um, you know, I was thinking that earlier this year, um, a few of us from the master plan group um, attended a, an evening meeting in Mountain View at a Seabass Center and a senior center. And it was an, uh, an event organized by the Alzheimer's Association. There were about 100 people there, and the stories we listened to were, were really heart-wrenching. Um, many people spoke about their family members that were strugg struggling in nursing facilities and struggling to find alternatives to nursing facilities. And then, you know, we fast forward um, a few months to, to today, um, in the midst of the COVID crisis, where um, we've seen a shocking number of deaths in nursing facilities and assisted living and boarding care homes. In my county, San Mateo County, two thirds of the deaths have occurred um, um, among people in these settings. So I think we have an urgency now more than ever to get people out of um, uh, and help them avoid um, congregate settings. Um, I applaud the administration's um, long-term care at home concept. I think it has, um, it has a lot of promise. Um, but at the same time, I don't think it makes sense to build a new program for the same people served by programs that are being eliminated or proposed for eliminations, for elimination. Um, you know, what happens to these individuals in the meantime? How will they be protected? 
um, especially um, since we don't know how long it'll take to build something new and what exactly that'll look like. Um, this crisis has also cast a really harsh spotlight on nursing facilities and their struggles. So I'm hoping we can commit to reform now. Um, you know, the challenge is really to build a, a unified strategy among, um, you know, the, all the regulators and payers and organizations involved with nursing homes to really improve their quality and through the creative use of payment and regulatory oversight. You know, clearly the old ways um, haven't worked and we have to do better. And finally, the other area I just wanted to touch on is social, social isolation. It's remarkable um, to me how much, how the state and our local communities have come together on this. At my health plan, Health Plan of San Mateo, we've implemented several strategies, but I'm most proud of um, what we've done in terms of what we call buddy calls, where um, our members who are all on Medi-Cal are calling, we have a program where they can call each other um, uh, and um, you know, be buddies to each other and have check-in calls once a week. And we're also trying to engage volunteers throughout the community to write letters to our members. Um, and I just wanted to end with some reminders of um, what uh, the impact of, some, of these simple human connections and what, what kind of impact they can have on people. So I'll read a few quotes from the people that have made calls. Uh, when I found out that Maria was hungry, out of toilet paper, and scared to leave her apartment, her neighbor and wider circle member, Jorge, dropped off a care package full of food and basic necessities on our doorstep. Maria called me back in tears out of gratitude. Uh, the second one, member Argentina cannot read or write. When I called, she was fearing the worst and desperate for COVID-19 news. We talked through all the things she can do to avoid catching the virus. We've been checking in daily and her energy has shifted from constant fear to a sense of empowerment. And finally, member Isabel, also alone and scared to leave her home, was passing her time in bed, sleeping all day and night. We put together a plan to change that. We're now playing crossword puzzles together virtually and she's making beaded jewelry for her neighbors, which is her favorite hobby. I check in on her daily and she's doing great. She told me today that she feels like herself again. Um, so uh, just in closing, these folks and others like them are, are gonna be isolated for much longer than any of us would like. So I think the challenge for all of us is how we sustain, how do we sustain our efforts, both local and statewide over many months and maybe even years to make sure um, we continue to connect to, to people. Thanks very much. Thank you, Maya. Janie Castillo, St. Mary Center. Uh, yes, can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, Janie, we can. Okay, great, sorry about that. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Kim. It, it looks like I'm gonna echo a little bit of the story that Maya just shared with you. I do want you to, to direct you to a New York Times article that um, will be mail, emailed to you today, or it was emailed yesterday from um, Amanda. It's about one of our seniors who stayed in our emergency shelter and it shares a deeper story about what it was like during the first stages of the COVID crisis here in West Oakland. Most, if not all, of our St. Mary seniors are at risk. They live with complicated health issues, some in less than optimal living situations, uh, that some could probably be most. On March 11th, which was the week that COVID really hit in the Bay Area, I was on a field trip with 20 seniors uh, going to Allensworth, which is four hours away. We were the only visitors in the whole park. Um, and on the way back, the news reports started coming in about the pandemic. And I kid you not, it felt like we were driving back to hell. Very worry began right away. Within days, the center was closed and our winter shelter was open 24 hours a day, seven days a week turning it into a safe haven for 28 unhoused seniors. More than half of our staff was sent home to work. Um, several shelter-in-place extensions later, we had moved seniors into transitional and permanent housing. I was moved to manage the food program, which had been transformed to delivery only. Since April, we have delivered over 1,700 meals, over 500 bags of food, and very proud to say that we've delivered 23 free desktop computers to seniors and families sheltering in place. 
After interviewing several case managers for this report, we have the following to share. The effects of COVID was sudden for seniors who were left in shock and set adrift. SMC responded by calling each one, establishing resources for food, health care, and finances. We have seniors who are taking shelter in place very seriously and are practicing good habits to keep themselves safe. Then there are those whose anxiety has exasperated and are scared of going out to pay bills, like Maya said, scared to shop to take a walk. To compensate, we use telephone reassurance, pass out PPE with information on their use, and very patiently coax them into a more healthy response. We have seen an increase of mental health issues and increased loneliness. We have seen seniors who are exhibiting a spectrum of symptoms from prolonged depression to one attempted suicide. Because of the need for companionship, and this is something we're really worried about, some seniors are ignoring the warnings by going to visit family and friends. We have found that there is an increased need to advocate to get physical appointments when symptoms warrant it. One of the case managers who works with our Filipino seniors has set up regular conference calls, and she helps them um, reach out to families and, and children who live in the Philippines. That makes a big difference. Many of our seniors are benefiting from the extra food stamps because they truly need it, and one of the local markets is doubling every food stamp dollar and offering curbside pickup, and I just want to clap for them. We have heard that some Asian seniors as, as you may know, are fearful of going outside. Yes, it's fear of contagion, but also of retaliation. I am to express to you how much we value our in-home support care workers. All but one have stayed with their seniors, offering valuable connection and support. They are lifesavers, truthfully. So these are three points I'd like to emphasize. We can split our seniors into three, two categories, those that can operate a smartphone, tablet, compu computer, therefore increasing their chances of staying connected, and those that can't. We need to move forward with our plans to build bridges to technology for seniors. This crisis has brought up the need for affordable internet, affordable devices, and training, training, training. Secondly, when the world turned upside down, for seniors, they found that relationships with their trusted providers changed dramatically. It made a difference when we made every effort to stay in touch and respond to their needs by phone. We ask that our doctors and our clinics do the same by reaching out to seniors regularly. Seniors need predictable and dependable access to health, food, and finances. When they can't get to us, we must go to them. Lastly. All of these services I have mentioned are for our existing clientele. Our challenge, and I know we are not alone, is how do we open safely to allow new seniors to walk through our doors into our community center for lunch, and how do we open our winter shelter again? We welcome a deep conversation with all of you to brainstorm how we provide quality services while keeping seniors and staff safe as the shelter in place lifts and the flu season returns. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. Rigo Saborio from St. Barnabas in Los Angeles. Thank you, Kim. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, reflect on what we've been through, uh, but to just give a quick uh, context uh, to give you a, pers a perspective of whom we're serving. St. Barnabas uh, serves primarily a low income, very diverse older, adult, uh, older adults living independently in the community. Our clients range anywhere from 60 to even up to 100 years old, majority being in their 70s. And most own and have little to no to buy. Most are dependent on social security as a primary income of about 1200 to 1600 per month. And 70% are foreign born with limited English proficiency, speaking uh, Chinese, Korean, and Spanish. And most of them have uh, multiple chronic conditions, hypertension, diabetes, and 90% are medi medis and have very little tech skills as well. And as you can imagine, and uh, they come to St. Barnabas uh, to address many of their problems uh, for, through consultations and counseling with our social case, uh, social workers, case managers. Um, and 
they're seeking emotional support. And uh, so we help to address that as well as the social determinants of health. Uh, they come to socialize, they come to dance, they come to play games, they come to exercise and get a meal as well. And in addition, also seek translation support uh, of materials and letters that they receive. Um, and also receive training on how to use technology and uh, navigate the internet. Essentially, we are their home away from home. We're an extension of their family or actually become their family in some cases. So as you can imagine, when the crisis hit uh, and our senior centers, our number of senior centers closed and our number of uh, congregate dining sites and uh, restaurants that we contract with uh, all closed as well as we had to cancel our big uh, tech conference and advocacy summit. Our seniors didn't have anywhere to go. They were left without the ability to socialize, to exercise, learn, and engage. And as a result, I mean, on a, you know, we expect that they, they, they grew in, increasingly anxious. They were scared. They were isolated alone. They were truly missing their friends and the connection with our staff. And, uh, and also, this, they were too afraid to leave their home. And to add insult to injury, some were threatened to be evicted from their homes and literally facing homelessness. And in some cases, they had part-time jobs or full-time jobs. And because of this economic crisis, some have actually now lost their jobs as well, adding to these problems. So all of this very destabilizing. So as a result, um, our job was to bring stability, comfort, and support. Our case managers, like others have pointed out, and, our, and additional staff made wellness and social calls to our clients, in some cases even two times per week per client. We recruited volunteers to build capacity to deliver meals to those who are now having to receive them at home as opposed to coming to our congregate sites. Uh, we sent informational flyers weekly with the meals to our clients because many of them had no other way of connecting with us. So that's the way we would connect to them. Um, and we also provided advocacy resources to fight evictions and secured emergency funds from donors and foundations to prevent evictions. Purchased, we also purchased appliances. In some cases, some people needed microwaves. Um, and in some cases, they also needed fans because obviously it's starting to get very hot. And many of these folks can't afford AC. So we had to really quickly work on that. We got, we bought them toiletries. We got, we actually even purchased PPEs for them, masks and other kinds of materials for them. Um, and we also, knowing that some of them can't connect via technology, we designed culturally appropriate info calls for our limited English proficient clients to address their emotional and other kinds of needs. So as I look at all this and sort of reflect, uh, you know, on what's happened, all I could say is really, I admire our clients. They are truly fighters. They're resilient. They've endured poverty, inequities, poor health, and many have given up so much just to, you know, to make this country their own. In, in our case, we, see, we, we serve so many foreign-born older adults. They're survivors and they're contributors to our society, but especially during this crisis, they are survivors, but need a lifeline. And that's where organizations like St. Barnabas and our other sister agencies, community-based organizations, you know, this is where they've come in and they've served as that lifeline, a service and support system that without, our clients would likely have ended up hungry in hospitals or in the streets, homeless. You know, it's a stark reminder as to why we are here as an organization and as a network. This is why we exist. You know, and, and that's to serve older adults because their lives truly matter. So as we think about where we want to make changes and where we want to cut and eliminate, let us be reminded as to the, the you know, what value we bring this time, not only in emergency, but just on, you know, emergency situations, but in sort of an ongoing situations we are definitely a lifeline and that's why we're here. Thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts. Thank you so much, Rigo. Dr. Fernando Torres-Gill. Oh, thank you, I hope you can hear me. I'll, I'll do mine briefly first. Uh, let me commend Rigo, Jamie, Maya, and all those who are on the front line 
and responding to the immediate needs of our constituents. And I'll take a, a little higher, not higher level, I'll take a different perspective. And first on my small part, I have a set of older persons, 90 years plus that I check in regularly. One, a 93 year old woman in East LA being taken care of by her 71 year daughter. Sadly, they were estranged from each other, domestic dilemma. So the 93 year old moved in with her 90 year old cousin in the Montebello area. Now she's worried, what if one of us gets sick? Who will take care of us? And those are the very people that Maya, Janie and Rigo are supporting and I'm doing my small part. But let me just add this other perspective um, I've been primarily uh, sheltering at home and teaching remote with our UCLA students, millennials, and Gen Z. And they are not only worried about their future implications in terms of jobs and their education, but they're now starting to realize that someday they may be older Certainly they have parents and grandparents. And so I've taken advantage of this terrible crisis to gerontologize them about not just what we do for today's elders and persons with disability, but how will they prepare for their future as they age, the lifespan perspective. And on that, I'd like to leave just two areas that I think are real crucial now for the future. The first, certainly the long-term care services and support and Sarah and her group have given us a wonderful, important, effective guidepost and roadmap for this as one of our most critical areas today and in the future. But the other is reminding us that not only older adults have been most impacted, but persons that are low income, ethnic and minority and diverse, especially African Americans and the Latino population so we have to ask ourselves, why is their health condition compromising them to make them more at risk? And we know it's about diabetes, it's high blood pressure, it's obesity. So in looking to the future with our master plan group, I hope that at some point we can give additional attention to what is it about unhealthy practices and therefore unhealthy aging that is going to increase those at risk as this, as this state becomes primarily majority minority. So looking to the future, those groups most at risk because of unhealthy practices and how we can reverse that long-term care. And uh, lastly, it's just fascinating if I can add a little humor to think that it's really the baby boomers for a lot of us, our cohort, that are now most impacted, most concerned. And I think back when we were younger in the 60s and 70s, and we never worried about growing older than 30. So it's interesting to see that we have a whole new constituency, our cohort, which is who we're serving. But of course, we now need to use the lifespan perspective to begin to prepare to be in a better situation five, 10, 15, 20 years from now for those younger cohorts. So thank you again and appreciate all the work everyone is doing. Thank you to each of you for grounding us in the lived experience uh, across the state in diverse communities, uh, grounding us both in the loss and the need for lifelines and also the incredible resilience that uh, older, older adults, people with disabilities, families, providers, all of you are showing in this incredible moment. With that grounding, I want us to turn to the open discussion about Master Plan from Aging, Next Steps. I'm gonna, like I said, do about two minutes of just table setting, and then panelists, you may raise your hand and we'll have an open discussion for about a half an hour. Next slide. Let me start with the basics, the timeline. Uh, back in the beginning, there was an executive order uh, in June, and we have been meeting and working uh, around the clock, many of you, uh, to head towards a final deadline of October 1st. And of course, we have now been on pause for about two and a half months and uh, working furiously on COVID. Um, March 15th, you see on the deadline, uh, on the timeline, excuse me, of the stay at home directive. Um, and you see that we um, are convening here today 
This was to be a full day meeting where we received the final recommendations from the Stakeholder Advisory Committee on goals two, three, and four. When we last met March 2nd, we received goal one and we had hoped in May to receive two, three, four. Uh, some data dashboard and some equity recommendations. Have a final meeting there. You see that hold on August 11th uh, and then have the report ready October 1st. So a couple timeline observations. Uh, obviously we're having a shorter meeting today uh, and we need to think about uh, how we will gather recommendations at a time when people are still fully engaged in the COVID response and in this new climate. Uh, how we wanna meet when we are gonna be continually um, uh, meeting remotely, uh, both to be responsive to public health and to be fully inclusive. And I think at a minimum, uh, we believe that the release needs to be pushed back that, same, that two, two and a half month window that we've been on pause uh, for the end of the year. So I'll just start with that proposal, some observations about timeline, a couple more months to build in a different pace of meetings, different frequency of meetings, different method of meetings. The next slide is some operational items. There are several uh, SAC business items open, if you will. Uh, first and foremost is the transmission of the LTSS subcommittee report to the administration. Um, Susan DeMaris can give us an update on that and there's uh, materials attached to the meeting about that. Second, uh, Kevin Prindeville, Justice and Aging has been organizing SAC to advise the administration on um, uh, response to COVID uh, in a series of ad hoc meetings that have happened the last few weeks. Uh, and we also had an equity work group meeting was our last official um, master plan meeting, uh, March 17th, which has been continuing to advise on equity issues such as uh, Dr. Torres Gill referred to, including the, the data disparities we're seeing, the cultural competency and the translations and interpretation for services and so, so much more. Uh, a third item is requesting a meeting. Uh, the SAC delivered a letter on Friday uh, to the governor, to secretary, as you heard earlier with Nina Harwell, uh, Nina Weiler Harwell as point from AARP requesting an immediate meeting on uh, budget and path forward. And that, that, that's in progress with the governor's office. And newly also on last Friday, uh, DHCS and agency and CDA uh, were able to announce uh, the concept of a long-term care at home benefit and the desire to engage master plan uh, SAC on advising on that. And that's very TBD, but that's the newest item on the list. So I just want to acknowledge that all four of those things in, are in flight and need to land. But pulling back, I think we would all acknowledge uh, two more slides here. Next slide. Uh, the biggest, uh, uh, sorry, go back one, Maria. The biggest um, uh, opportunity and challenge and urgency is to incorporate the learnings and impacts, the kind of which we just heard. Uh, the health impacts, the losses, the economic impacts, the housing impacts, the psychological impacts, um, the, on and on, all that we had set out to do, we are learning and seeing impacts of right now. And how do we make the master plan relevant uh, to this moment and to the vision of the future for 2030, which we were called to do. And then the fourth uh, uh, slide we'll just share is that uh, we are thrilled to announce that even before uh, COVID hit, we had been talking uh, a lot with the governor and with uh, Maria Shriver and the Alzheimer's Prevention and Preparedness Task Force about how aligned we were in our vision, in our goals, in our partners, in our strategies. And we will be aligning with the governor's Alzheimer's Prevention and Preparedness Task Force we're very fortunate that Susan DeMorris is, uh, there she is in the bottom row, two below Maria, uh, is on both bodies and has been actively involved in the leadership of both and will be advising us on that so that the master plan can both bring um, an uh, even deeper dementia friendly lens to all of the recommendations and also have a, a very zoom, a strong zoom in, if I can use that metaphor, on dementia as well. So more to come on that. The Alzheimer's Task Force is meeting next on June 2nd, on Tuesday, and then we'll be announcing uh, more details about how the alignment is going to go forward. But we are um, uh, pleased to announce that with you today. So with that, four pieces of information, uh, the, the timeline considerations, the open business, the obviously the COVID uh, impacts which continue uh, in this moment, and the Alzheimer's alignment. I do want to open it up for SAC discussion. Uh, the way it's going to work is uh, you can raise your hand. Uh, again, we are uh, new at this technology, so I'm hoping that raising hand works for folks. Uh, and if you are on the phone as a panel, as a SAC member, um, 
please email Amanda and we'll try to uh, figure out how to open your line. But with that, um, I'm starting to see the blue hands go up, which suggests that we are ready for discussion. Um, and Maria, would you uh, call on folks, please, the best you can, the order they raise their hands. Sure. Um, Kevin, you've had your hand raised for a while. Do you want to? Yeah, great. Thank you so much uh, for, for calling on me and for uh, having this meeting today. Um, I'm sorry that our discussion here is getting uh, shortened quite a bit because I think there is quite a lot to discuss. Um, the SAC has been doing some work together um, to think about the important items that we wanted to make sure came up today. So we actually have some people queued up to, to hit on key items. So if there's an, an opportunity to, to, um, to use what we prepared uh, to make sure that we're able to cover as much of the items as possible as quickly as possible, given our short time, that would be great. Um, I, I want to start just by saying um, that we thought this meeting was really critical because, um, you know, we came to this work as a collective group uh, and really worked with the administration to set a core set of values that would drive our work together. And I'm going to ask Bruce in a minute to kind of outline those values. But we've been concerned by, um, you know, several action we've seen since we last met where uh, that doesn't feel like there's alignment between the values that we set together and the actions of the administration. In some places, there has been. There, there have been um, some really good efforts undertaken as part of the COVID response. And then in other spots, we've seen action in the COVID crisis that hasn't aligned with what we thought our values were and with uh, the governor's stated intention to prioritize um, our population, um, not just in the COVID crisis, but in the long-term planning of the state. And so we've been uh, you know, concerned by uh, policies that came out around crisis care standards, or you know, even while there's been a lot of work done around SNFs and RCFEs, where across the state, you know, 43% of deaths are in SNFs and RCFEs. Across the state, 80% of deaths are among older adults. Um, you know, we still don't see a statewide strategy and a leadership structure that we understand for addressing the problems in those places. And then I think, you know, most recently the governor's revised, uh, the, his governor's uh, May revision of the budget took extreme cuts to senior programs, including the programs that keep people out of nursing homes and have been keeping seniors alive in our communities throughout this crisis. Um, and, and the cuts seem to be disproportionately towards older people. And Secretary Gailey and, and Fig spoke earlier about this being a tough time and tough decisions. But th this, these aren't decisions that had to be made. You know, the Senate pushed forward a plan last night that doesn't include cuts like this. Um, so we're concerned about this misalignment between the values that we thought we shared and the, the idea of this master planning process and, and then the actions of the administration. And so that's why we had asked for a meeting with the governor. We had asked uh, almost a week ago. We haven't gotten a response. We're meeting today. Yesterday, the governor at, at about the same time yesterday was meeting with yoga studios and gyms to see how they were doing. Last week, he was meeting with Hollywood to see how Hollywood was doing. 80% of deaths are among older adults in this COVID crisis. You know, it's older adults and the workers that serve them that are most at risk, and he hasn't been able to find time to meet with us. So, you know, these are some foundational issues, I think, for all of us. We, we've got some people queued up to go into more detail on each of these important pieces. And then I know there's also people raising their hands too, many of whom are part of our, our queue. <laughs> Um, but I thought, you know, if it, we had talked about, we wanted to kind of start with values and, and, and if Bruce is, is available to, to jump in here to t kind of talk about where we're coming from, from values. And then we had asked Nina to talk about why we think it's important to meet with the governor. We hope that Jeannie would talk a little bit about where we think we are in the COVID response. We have a couple people like Debbie and Jody and Rigo to talk about our concerns on the budget. Um, Susan to talk about what's going on in the master plan and the work the LTSS subcommittee has done. Um, and then Marty and Donna to talk about, uh, you know, potential, but also a lot of questions we have around the LTSS at home benefits. Um, and then there's other important voices in our, in our uh, community too, they're gonna wanna jump in um, throughout. So and those were, you know, things we wanted to make sure we hit on. So maybe if, if Bruce could kind of lead us off in the bringing us back to those important values that were really you know, at the table to promote together. Sure, thanks for that introduction, Kevin. First, I, I really do want to thank um, Kim and uh, Secretary Galley and Fig for you all being on the phone with us. Um, 
and uh, to kind of share where we are. I, I also think the most important thing on behalf of the entire SAC to say up front is we appreciate your continued commitment to a master plan. Um, the master plan is an important um, framework document for the future of the state. It's important for the future of not just uh, Kim's department and the agency as a whole, but how the other uh, agencies and departments work together. And so that really remains an important goal, but its time horizon is different than solving the budget cuts we face today. You know, and I will say, you know, on behalf of the SAC, we appreciate uh, Mark and Kim and, and, you know, by extension, Fig and the, all the other folks in the administration, seeing the SAC as an important and helpful group in, you know, potentially trying to ad ad advance and inform those discussions. Um, that's created some challenges for us because the SAC was set up for a very specific purpose, and I'm going to talk about our values here in a sec. Um, and in some ways, issues are being raised where SAC members are member are, are you have the smartest people in the state, some of the smartest people in the state, frankly, with respect to aging and disability issues. There are other folks, however, who are not on the SAC who are also super smart, um, who would have input, and we're mindful of those folks. And many, many people on, on the SAC actually come from organizations that have uh, fundamental advocacy responsibilities, which is not actually what the SAC was created to do. It's not that we can't have a voice and a shared opinion, but it's it's actually meant to be the advisory group to you, Mark, and to the other department heads in the cabinet who are agency heads who are responsible for creating the master plan and by extension to the governor. And so I just want to be clear that you know you've we are glad to serve and we have done that as you've asked, but you've also complicated our role. And I just I think it's important for you guys to respect that as I sort of lean into the values for a sec. The thing I just want to re-emphasize is something that Kim said, you know, this is about respect and value, you know, in, in both directions. And I do think it's time for the governor to show up and meet with us. And I, well, having been a public servant myself, so I'll own this co comment and not tack it to the sack. Um, I think, um, you know, it, 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 it doesn't, you know, it, I understand the challenges of serious budget crises that you all face. And I think everybody on this SAC respects how difficult the position is that you all are in. But when sort of things come out of the blue, um, the crisis care guidelines um, and, you know, these cuts, they're, they're really problematic. I'm not telling you stuff that you don't know, but um, I think seeing, treating us and seeing us as partners um, is really, really important. And I think this group is willing to serve in that role. And I think that's why the values are really important to get to what Kevin asked me to touch on. You know, I think we lead with our values. So even if you have organizations here, who some of them who actively advocate, some of them who can't advocate, sometimes you might have SAC members with differing viewpoints on a particular um, item. I think that this idea that our values are not um, wallpaper, like they are in a bunch of organizations that just do them for the sake of having them. But this idea that choices are really important, and that means access, quality, and autonomy for folks, uh, the folks that we care about in the aging and disability community. Equity is incredibly important. And so this idea uh, that we need to focus on eliminating health and social disparities for all the reasons we know about is incredibly important. That we put dignity first, and that disruption of uh, age bias and ableism uh, and discrimination is a really, really important part of this. And that we actually walk that talk. We don't just say we believe in those things, that we do those things in our action and our planning. That we focus on inclusion and accessibility and just how important that is for older adults and, and all uh, people with disabilities. That innovation and evidence-informed practice is really important. So we laud you, for example, and think starting to think through a new long-term care at home benefit. And the idea that we could get rid of a bunch of slot-based, waiver-based programs that don't reach many, many people who need them is terrific. And actually seeing it as a Medi-Cal benefit is great, but that doesn't solve the problem of the impacts of the proposed cuts, nor does it meet the needs of folks whose services are outside what that benefit might do, but still need some kind of community-based service. 
And, you know, I guess I would finally, you know, end with this um, idea of partnerships, that this has always been about partnerships amongst local, state, and federal governments, philanthropy, and the private sector. I'd really encourage you to get back to that sense of partnership with us. And I think it's really there, but we really need to, to reinvest in it, given the difficult times we've been in. And I think there's others we need to draw to the table, particularly the private sector and others, to help advance this discussion. So, Kevin, thanks. I'll turn it back to you. Uh, thanks, Bruce. I, I, we'd like next to, uh, for Nina to talk more about why we think it's important uh, for us to be able to meet with the governor at this time. Sure. So, um, <clears throat> good morning, Nina Weiler Harwa with ARP, and and Kevin already stated. Kevin and Bruce have all stated really why this is important. But I want to drive some of these points home, um, Bruce. We do, let me back up and say, we do appreciate, or at least I'll speak for myself, I appreciate that we've heard today that um, the you all are working on the logistics of having us meet with the governor. We ask that that would be sooner rather than later. Um, but really, I wanna hit a couple of more points about why this is so important. Um, first of all, Bruce really pointed out um, that we see ourselves as partners in this effort, and that really needs to be a two-way uh, street, two-way communication. Um, we've got to see that we are aligning stated goals of a livable California for all, not just in words, but in actions. Um, as you are quite aware, uh, members of the SAC were already deeply concerned that on one hand, an incredibly, I believe, and, and and the SAC did uh, vote to uh, push this forward, we put out a really important report, the LTSS subcommittee report, which I know still needs to be fully finalized. But in there is, is a rich set of ideas of how we move California forward, just in the area of long-term sports and services, um, in a manner that is equitable, meaningful, that doesn't always go to, okay, where do we cut? Where do we, what, what do we reduce? But rather really thinks very broadly and systematically about how we over the long term create a system of long term supports and services that will not will be there for all Californians, not just those who are extremely low income and disabled, but in within that report as well is an important recommendation regarding a future LTSS or uh, long-term care insurance benefits. Um, so as, the, as a group, I believe we've already shown our incredible commitment to this process. Um, we were, and we've already said this, we were, we were appointed to provide expertise in the area of future planning for an aging California. Um, we worked, we've already worked really hard, not just on the report, but each of the subgroups for area two, three, and four are working extremely hard to develop recommendations, both for short and long-term, both in the COVID reality short-term world, as well as long-term. Um, so it, this is why it is so important that we get this meeting, because we need to hear from the person who is running the entire state. Yes, I am committed. Yes, this is something that, you know, we're going to take these recommendations, some of which you've already put forward. We're gonna look at these really seriously and we're gonna start looking at a different way to do business in California. Can't always be defaulting to the same thing, the cuts, the reductions in services, kind of shifting things around between waivers and state plan amendments. Um, so, I won't take up too much more time on this because I think that the preceding speakers already spoke to why this is important. Um, but uh, we do look forward to being able to set some time with the governor very shortly to begin to work through these issues and discuss again our shared collective commitment to such, such an important mission. So thanks a lot. So we had Janie queued up next to talk uh, a bit about the COVID response. And if I can ask everybody to try to keep your comments just to one or two minutes, because there's also others that we didn't have in our queue that have their hands up and that we want to hear from as many as possible. So 
Jeannie, if you could quickly talk about where we're at with COVID. Yeah, great. So I, I just want to underscore Nina's comments. Echo, echo, echo. Uh, so, so critical. Thank you to all the other speakers. Um, so I, I also want to thank you, Kim, for your diligence in keeping us pulled together and also uh, to all the other speakers who have made such valuable comments. But there has been significant progress in the response to COVID-19. Um, and I just want to comment a little bit on the impact. So there have been adjustments to the leniencies from certain existing regulations that have been very significant to providers in the plethora of congregate settings around the state, like life plan communities, CCRCs, skilled nursing, assisted living, as well as other home and community-based settings. Um, there also is a very critical element of training and uh, certifications that have had some leniencies and requirements that also have helped on our statewide response. And we're grateful because it's made many activities so much easier to have all those leniencies. There also has been a very acute attention drawn to the need for affordable housing were the many who live on the precipice of homelessness, and we're seeing that more acutely even today. Um, so as we look forward, I think it's critical that we begin to shift our thinking to what we need for reopening. And with that reopening, the congregate facilities and communities are still caring for the same older adults and those with disabilities. These are the extremely vulnerable individuals that you've already heard about and that you know about. So I think it's critical that we remember those individuals in those congregate settings still exist today and by their nature are caring for these vulnerable individuals. So we have to be diligent and clear on our approach to reopening and recognize that the consequences of ongoing and extreme social isolation also exist. To that end, we ask that you be clear and seek our expertise from the many SAC members who are directly or indirectly responsible for the thousands of older adults and those with disabilities living in these congregate settings and in home and community-based services. We know it's a challenging time to lead, but we ask a couple of things. One, that you make testing available and be clear on testing frequency, how it will occur when staffing is limited, and the importance of who is going to pay for it. Uh, number two, that you make available adequate PPE. As noted in a March 16th email, there are about 670,000 healthcare workers in California, according to the EDD. And in SNFs, they require, in SNFs alone, they require about that number, 670,000 masks per day. And it's very difficult to acquire those. And even though supplies have become more accessible, accessible surges in the disease, required infection control procedures, and upcoming natural disasters that we all deal with in our state annually, as Dr. Galley said earlier today, are gonna to limit availability. So we need to make sure that those things exist. And number three, that we make visitation requirements clear in these congregate settings, noting that the deepening impact of social isolation on these populations is going to continue to exist. And as many of you know, just, um, Two days ago, we heard of the very um, un unfortunate and devastating impact on a couple in Northern California who had a murder-suicide in one of our member communities. We want an improved structure, as already been said, related to decision-making and leadership for these communities as we cross over many of the departments and often the regulations, while not necessarily conflicting, are often confusion confusing. So with that, um, thank you so much for everything that you're doing, the ongoing work that pulls us all together. And we know that you're pulled to, in many different directions every day. Um, but we hope that you'll be able to continue to focus on the reopening of these communities in a very clear and diligent way so that our vulnerable older adults and those with disabilities continue to be um, protected and not so severely impacted by COVID-19. And again, ask the governor to show up. So next we had a few speakers lined up to talk about the budget impact and, and how much the budget hits both older adults and people with disabilities. Um, so starting with Debbie and then um, Jody and then uh, Rigo, but again, try to keep yourself just real brief because we're gonna end up moving into public comment period soon too and other SAC members to hear from, thanks. 
Okay, thank you, Kevin. I just want to, um, first of all, thank you, Kim. Obviously, um, this wouldn't have been your choice for how to move things forward. Um, but I do want to point out, as Kevin said, the Senate has provided a proposal that does not harm our population. And the governor's executive order was very clear about creating a California for all, for people with disabilities and for people as they age. It specifically called out the backbone of our services, which are community-based adult services and the multi-purpose senior services programs, who pivoted on a dime to partner with the California Department of Aging to completely redesign everything that they're doing to serve the people that are most at risk for those skilled nursing placements and who are most at risk for death from this virus it is unconscionable that the administration would immediately go to cuts there. And so there's something in the system that we absolutely have to fix there. In MSSP, the population serves about 12,000 a year, 65 and older who are eligible for skilled nursing placement. There have been 15 recorded cases of COVID and three deaths. Compare that to the statistics that Kevin said, and there's no excuse for this. So we need to at least address and fix this part of the system, recognizing that a California for all includes keeping the infrastructure in place first. Thank you. Great, and Jody. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanna start by just saying how grateful I am to everybody who is on the SAC, to Kim, to Secretary Galley, to FIG, to, to, for helping um, continue this conversation, but especially to those people and organizations that have been on the front line. I, I just, um, I think we need to, we, we're certainly all here to support um, and encourage choice and dignity and uh, community-based service, especially in this time where the, the deaths are happening in, in um, skilled nursing facilities and we're trying to keep people out of them. The workforce, the IHSS workers, the home care workers, um, the food deliverers, the social workers, all of those folks have been keeping um, people home safely and we need to build on that and not look at these cuts. And so rather than repeat what Debbie just said and many others, the other thing I just wanna put out there as it relates to the cuts, we should be building on the programs that we've now experienced, not only work in normal situations, but have completely shifted as, as Debbie said, to address this, the, the virus and the, the universe that we're living in. But instead of always talking about cuts, I don't hear very much um, talk about revenue. And, you know, there's a couple ways to look at revenue that I really think need to be part of the conversation. One is cost savings. It is much more expensive, as we all know, to have someone wind up in a nursing home or still nursing facility than it is to be able to provide the care for them at home. And that is what a lot of our LTSS report um, builds from, and we need to be thinking about that because if these cuts go through, we are going to see people not only potentially die, but move into an environment that's going to wind up costing more money. Yes, we need to get as much money from the federal government as we possibly can, and I think everyone on this call, all 275 of us, plus the others who weren't able to make it, are willing to do our part to encourage Congress to um, provide the most robust benefit. But there are other ways to look at revenue um, at the state level that we haven't addressed, you know, looking at wealth taxes or oil severance taxes or other ways to bring in dollars so that we don't have to go through this exercise of cutting, which at, at, at present I feel that the cuts um, are, are so um, geared towards the populations that we serve, which just makes me feel like um, we're kind of counterproductive. Here we are trying to uphold the values that Bruce started us off with, and yet some of these proposals are so ageist and so ableist that we're like fighting against each other and we can do so much better. And our goal is to try and get us there. And I think everybody here is willing to be helpful but we need to build up from what we know works and not from, um, from starting over by cutting the very programs that are keeping us healthy and safe. 
Thanks. It appears that Kevin got knocked off and I think next up was Rigo. Yes, thank, thank you so much. And again, I wanna echo what uh, my colleagues have expressed so eloquently and I wanna start by thanking again, Kim and for your leadership and the team, and the team as well. Um, but sort of where I ended my comments in terms of, uh, you know, older adults lives matter and them being very resilient you know, no matter how resilient, uh, you know, they are and how much of survivors they are, they need a lifeline, as I mentioned. Yet these programs proposed to be cut are a lifeline to not only the older adults themselves, but also to the family structure and the community at large. It's all interconnected. So as we are proposing cuts, it doesn't just harm an individual. It harms the family structure and communities, both from, you know, from, uh, the human side, but also from economic side. And, and since others already have expressed this, I'll just, I'll just say with this. I think historically, you know, we've seen too many budget cuts impacting older adults. Um, and this current crisis has shed light on how these past decisions play out today. So I implore us all, in which I believe that this master plan is really the pathway forward, is that, you know, let's learn from the past and hold steady to keep the lifeline strong. This is not a time to strengthen, uh, and this is not a time to weaken actually, but to strengthen lifeline. So, uh, so that's where I think we need to really focus. It's not how to weaken, where to cut, but rather how to strengthen. Thank you. And I believe Kevin is back in, but he's as, a, as an attendee instead of a panelist. So he's having some technical so, difficulties. I, my notes were that Susan and Marty and Donna were gonna go and I see that Andy has his hand up. So I'm wondering if we can do those four and then go to public comment. Do you think that works? Yep. It, yes. So. Yep. so this is Susan. Um, I'm speaking for all of my SAT colleagues that we remain committed to this effort. In fact, you might've heard we're fired up. Um, on behalf of the LTSS subcommittee, we are extremely proud to formally submit today the final LTSS report <clears throat> as, <clears throat> excuse me, as was unanimously approved at the March meeting. As most of you know, this report is the product of hundreds of hours of collective work and outstanding leadership by nearly everyone on this Zoom meeting and many, many more. Most notably, Lydia Missalides, Claire Ramsey, Catherine Blakemore, and Sarah Steenhausen. We started with five big ideas and they proved to be prescient, uh, navigation, access, affordability, workforce, and governmental structure. Today at this SAC meeting, we urge immediate transmittal of the LTSS report to the governor, Secretary Galley, and the cabinet secretaries who make up the master plan um, leadership. Attached to the report that has been submitted is a transmittal letter and a new preface. The preface underscores our, our shared California values and the principles of equity. It also reinforces our original recommendations and it captures new learnings in the wake of COVID. We want to call out five timely additions um, in the wake of COVID. One, the need for gubernatorial level leadership that is coordinated and engaged. Two, we want to acknowledge the temporary gateways to information, resources, and referrals, but note that these in initiatives reveal to us what a massive undertaking this is to do well. Paid and unpaid direct care staff are in the eye of this storm and need our focus. Fourth, new licensed congregate setting models must emerge from this ordeal. And finally, we all must grab a hold of the flexibility, nimbleness, and ingenuity we've all displayed through this crisis. This will prove to be our path forward. So today, we're proud to formally transmit the LTSS report. And with that, um, I will pass it to our next speaker. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Donna, do you want to go first? No. Okay, uh, this is Marty. Uh, let me say a little bit about the LTSS. I was, Marty, Marty, I was on mute. Yes, I'm ready to go. And I'll okay, let you go wrap ahead, it up. No, you, go, you go first. I'll go second. Okay. 
<laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, of course, thank you to Kim, Secretary Galley, and Fig for this opportunity to really listen and hear our the stakeholders discussion so far. One of the things I just want to emphasize, because we do want to have more conversation, is that really our goal is to remove the systemic barriers that have been contributing to the financial and emotional stress that our older adults and their family members are experiencing now, have in the past, and probably will in the future. But if we're able to move forward with our promise to California that we will have a master plan on aging that will always include not only the person-centered approach to people, but also embracing families that help with care, that do the medications, that are there to help navigate the healthcare system. And of course, as we've noticed during this COVID crisis, families and friends are the, on the front lines of keeping our older adults in the community and away from nursing homes, hospitals, they have been the protectors. You've even heard um, Dr. Fernando, who already discussed his involvement with being an informal caregiver. So what we want to make sure is that we continue in the right direction. We know that the LTSS discussion will, is something that um, we have very few details at this point, but we'll, as we move on, we really are looking forward to being an integral part of that discussion and to remember to extend that out to other members of the aging um, community, but also to people that are um, working um, on other areas such as and with aging services, but also those that may be also working on just general family issues because half of the caregivers are working caregivers and they have to have supports in place like MSSP and CBAS so that they can work and thrive and care and provide that multicultural and multi-generational uh, care for our families and friends in the communities who are older adults. I'll move it on to, go ahead, Marty. Okay, thank you, Donna, and thanks everybody. Uh, I think on Friday afternoon, uh, J.C. Cooper, who's the head of Medi-Cal, and Brad Gilbert, the head of DHCS, uh, asked us to meet and rolled out the idea of a state plan amendment to do a statewide long-term services at home benefit. Uh, a very exciting possibility with lots of details to be worked on and ask us as a SAC if we would be uh, involved in planning that. And I think we will be when the time is, is right. But I just wanted to say a couple things about it. Number one, it's very important to think about a concept that gets beyond the silos that we've had in the past and gets us a health and a long-term services and supports benefit that's fully integrated. That's one of the goals of the LTSS uh, report that came out that Susan just talked about a minute ago. So getting to that fully integrated service that beats the silos and is easy for our consumers to use has been a long-term goal of almost all of us on the SAC. I think though we have to just remember that we can't do that until we solve the CBAS MSSP problem in the budget. Uh, we can't go for a period of time on a promise of an LTSS benefit that maybe we can work out sometime in 2021 while we're cutting key services to stay in the community. The, the promise of these benefits is to keep people out of nursing homes, to keep them out of the place where they're dying from COVID. And we have to keep all of those benefits in place and we have to make sure the baseline stays there. And then we go on to plan for this very exciting new benefit, which we will do. And we'll all together try to get that right so that it's a real improvement uh, and one that we would be proud of as the master plan moves forward. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. I do want to call on Andy and assure our public that we are still going to do the full 20 minutes of public comment. Our captioners and other team can stay uh, through past 1030 to hear the public comment. But uh, Andy, would you provide the last uh, SAC comment, please? 
Thank you, Kim. And I, I want to just start by um, Kim acknowledging your leadership and, and the effort to make sure that disability rights is part of the conversation about the master plan for aging. And I appreciate how many people have brought up disability issues in their comments. I just want to close and I'll be brief by remembering the governor's press conference on the Sunday uh, where he announced the shelter in place. And he was very clear that he was asking all Californians to make a sacrifice so that we could protect vulnerable Californians from this pandemic. And I, I would just like to take that theme and apply it to the budget and what we do to rebuild the economy in California. This pandemic has disproportionately affected people with disabilities, people of color, seniors, and when we think about the budget, we need to think about what are we doing to protect those populations, to make investments to support those populations, and what are we doing to ask all Californians to make sacrifices in order for that to happen? And that, to me, is the thing that's really missing in the governor's proposal. What are we doing as a state to make sacrifices to respond to this unprecedented fiscal crisis? And we need people that have done well to support people who are vulnerable, and we don't so far, we haven't heard that message coming from the governor, and that's ho I'm hoping that's something we can see moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy, and to all of you for such um, thoughtful and carefully organized so we can hear so many different voices on so many different issues uh, in such a short period of time. I'm going to turn it to public comment. Uh, Maria is going to run that for us. We have eight people with their hands up. We have 20 minutes set aside. Uh, we urge you to try to do the minute so that we can hear from 20 people in 20 minutes, uh, but very much want to remind you that we can also take comment uh, by email, engage at aging.ca.gov, and if there's any accessibility issues, we can uh, do that over the phone or over mail, uh, but do want to hear from as many voices as possible. Maria, will you start us with the queue, please? Yeah, absolutely. We've got Tony who's going to um, go first. Tony, go ahead. Okay, um, Tony, we'll loop back around. Uh, Bree Hankers, I hope I'm getting that right. Bree, you might have to unmute yourself. Your, your line is open on this end. Sorry, I didn't mean to press the button. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Um, Jeffrey? Jeffrey, did you have some comments? Looks like you're muted on your end. Hello, this is Jeffrey. Um, first thing I will say to uh, Kim, likewise, uh, appreciates your leadership, um, pushing this week for getting revenues, and this afternoon and today, the Senate will be meeting on budget. Um, comment here for today is that uh, you sounded very low volume, like you were in the other room. So I know this is the first time you did a virtual meeting, but increase that because it was very hard trying to send a public comment. I got back the engage, not being the right way to uh, send a public comment. But in trying to increase, since yesterday spoke to the budget committee um, in regards to increasing revenue as the focus, and I agree with the things that I've heard said, and let's keep pushing on. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, just going to loop back around and see, Tony, if you're ready, you can go ahead and unmute. Okay, how about Colin? Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great. Um, I was a little bit late to the meeting, so I'm not sure if I missed this, but I wanted to see if there were any discussions about transportation or paratransit. It certainly has come up from uh, our presenters sharing on the front line some of the, the challenges and it is absolutely part of the master plans framework. Uh, today has mostly been focused about the COVID response and the way forward, uh, less so than specific policy recommendations. But transportation recommendations are welcome anytime. Paratransit is absolute, transportation overall is absolutely part of the master plan approach. Okay, great, thank you. So, um, next we've got Sasha. Sasha Bittner. Hello. Hi. 
I'm I'm Darth Bittner. Hello, I'm Darth Bittner. And I'm with Dan and Ann. And I'm with Hand and Ann. And the Domestic Employers Network. The Domestic Employers Network. I I live in San Francisco. I live in San Francisco. And I've been employed and the um, yeah, I the boy that my mom can work with for over 25 years. And I've employed home care workers over 25 years. And Lindsay is going to Lindsay. I'm on is going to read my statement. Uh, and Lindsay E. My Hong is going to read my statement. Uh, first, thank you to the SAC for all of the hard work that you're putting in um, and that you have put in. Uh, we, uh, I, and Hand in Hand agree that now is the time to be shoring up our existing programs that enable seniors and people with disabilities to remain independent in their homes than to dismantle them. And it's clearer than ever that we are safer if we are able to age and live with dignity at home and not in institutions. So I'm here to urge you, Director Wade and Secretary Galley, um, and to continue to support members of the SAC to use your power to influence the governor to rethink the priorities in the budget and to not take from LTSS programs like IHSS, uh, MSSP, CBAS, SSI, et cetera, um, and to look instead for funding from programs like prisons, uh, to use the rainy day fund, and to create new revenue, new progressive revenues, such as uh, the Schools and Communities First Initiative, so that we don't have to make cuts in the very social safety net that we all depend on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we've got Lorinda Reynolds. Lorinda, you may have to unmute yourself. Okay, we'll, we'll come back around. Oh, there you are. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I echo all the previous comments and I'm grateful to all of the work that all of you are doing. Um, to speak to Debbie's question, the cuts are rooted in internalized and externalized ageism on personal and institutional levels. Institutionalized ageism marginalizes older people and is also why older people become accepting of marginalization. It is insidious. In other words, people do not know they are engaging in it while they are doing it. And if they're in positions of power, it translates into changes in policy. Advocating for any vulnerable group is a strategic process. It is extremely for important. And to get any movement in the right direction often requires extreme effort and generalized superlative statements. This is referred to as compassionate ageism because negative aspects of aging or challenges faced by a subgroup of special needs are exaggerated emphasized and constantly in the public's eye. Once the effort succeeds, there is an inadvertent backlash called compassionate ageism when the messages expressed during the campaign are generalized to all older people. And it takes a strategic positive message to restore healthy perspectives on aging in the aftermath. With COVID-19, I believe we have an opportunity to mediate and minimize the compassionate ageism backlash at least here in California. It doesn't require us to change our messages about older people being vulnerable. It does require us to insist that messages about other vulnerable groups get equal time. As Fernando mentioned, there are many disproportionately impacted groups that include people of all ages with compromised health conditions, including all ethnicities, races, and SES, low SES. If any of you are in a position to influence messaging to the general population, I implore you to be vigilant and push for balanced messages that do not overly focus on older people um, as being the justification for shelter in place and extreme changes in social policies. That's it, thank you. 
Thank you, Lorinda. I want to note that we are at 1030. And just as we said, we're going to stay on to, to do uh, finish the public comment time. And I'm grateful to see so many SAC members are willing to do the same. Thank you so much for uh, this chance to be in dialogue. Maria, who's next? Um, that's going to be Marty Omoto. Uh, Marty, you are unmuted on this end, but you may have to unmute on your end. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank Marty Yamoto, family member, CD Can, California Disability Senior Command, uh, Senior Action uh, Network, and also member of the uh, subcommittees of uh, the Master Plan for Aging. First, I want to thank everyone, uh, Kim, but also the state staff from all the departments for their hard work uh, for the Master Plan, but also in response to COVID. It's, we, we all deeply appreciate it. Number two, strongly support the words of my colleagues uh, on the stakeholder group, but also on the subcommittees, uh, especially on, on the issue of uh, proposed cuts, but also more, more importantly on alternatives. Third, this is, a, you know, as we all know, a, a public health crisis uh, that is unprecedented. It's a pandemic uh, with no end in sight. And so toward that end, strongly urge, as my colleagues have urged, uh, for the stakeholder group and the governor and the administration to really take a hard look at the recommendations and the long-term services and supports uh, subcommittee uh, recommendations. It provides guardrails, uh, you know, for better solutions, but it also provides some off-ramps against uh, bad ideas and cuts and on-ramps, you know, to a better future for us. So again, thank you to all of you who is there, who are there. Thank you. Thanks, Marty. Next, we've got Nancy, Nancy Krebs. Hi, my name is Nancy Krebs. Thank you for your time today. And I'm here to ask that you please preserve existing LTSS programs in the state budget and expand them with the Universal Social Insurance Program. And here's why. Active seniors with dementia, like my mom, face enormous costs when their desire to keep active results in the need for one-on-one -on -one care. My mom rode her bike up steep Oakland Hills into her late 70s, and even as she developed dementia in her 80s, she was walking several miles a day. At 86, she entered assisted living. She remained active, but her mind was failing. 18 months later, she was getting lost while walking on a tendon and her care facility was gonna require one of two care options, an aid to attend her four to six hours each day, too costly, or transition her to a lockdown memory care unit to limit her activity. And fortunately, her doctor deemed this to be cruel and unusual punishment, so she was not admitted. So short of other options, the best we, option we found was to send mom to Mexico to receive humane, affordable care. And this has been heart-wrenching and a huge relief heart-wrenching to send her away from us, her family, and a huge relief because she can remain an active senior who can participate in the things that matter to her because she now has a loving caretaker who takes her outdoors, walking daily. We wish mom were here in California with us and just an LTSS program could help my family afford this. Please preserve existing LTSS programs in the state budget and expand them with the Universal Social Insurance Program. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you very much, Nancy, for sharing. Very grateful. Okay, our next, uh, our next comment is coming from a phone number ending in 8201. Your line has been open on this end. Hi, my name is Jeff Tom. I'm with the California Council of the Blind. I'm also an LTSS subcommittee member. I want to first uh, associate myself with uh, the comments of Marty Emoto, and I want to make one other point and pick up on something that Bruce indicated. Um, uh, unfortunately, through no fault of its own, obviously, the SAC is not fully inclusive. There are communities that are not really represented on it, and one of them is those with, with sensory disabilities, both those who are deaf or hard of hearing, and the community I represent, those with vision loss. Preferably, any meeting with the governor would include representatives of our communities. And if it doesn't, it is incumbent upon you and the SAC to do your best to reflect our unique concerns and perspectives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Next, we've got Russell. Russell Rawlings, your line's been open. Uh, 
Good morning, Stakeholder Advisory Committee members. I truly appreciate your willingness to stay on. My name is Russell Rawlings, and I am the statewide community organizer for California Foundation for Independent Living Centers. Through our disability organizing network, we organize around cross-disability issues with community organizers and systems change advocates throughout the state. We encourage the SAC to continue us supporting us in preventing budget cuts that would be catastrophic for the state's long-term services and support system systems such as in-home supported services. As someone who relies on in-home supported services, a 7% cut to my hours would mean a 7% cut in my care. It means that I would have almost 10% less time to eat, bathe, and perform other necessary activities of daily living. The SEC was appointed to increase and expand, uh, further expand long-term services and supports for California's growing aging and disabled population, eliminating and cutting programs such as independent living centers, MSSP, CBAS, nutrition programs, and aging and disability resource centers does not reflect the vision of the California for all. CFILC continues to uh, support California's independent living centers. The independent living center movement was founded on giving people the right to live independently in their own homes and in the communities of their own choosing. We are saddened and horrified by the large number of people affected by COVID-19, especially people with disabilities, older adults, and the personal assistance providing care. We urge the SAC to insist that the governor not provide legal immunity to nursing homes and other institutionalized settings. It goes against the Olmstead decision and increases the number of marginalized disabled people within these settings. Let us not disenfranchise those who need us the most now more than ever. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Russell. Uh, next, we've got Michael Lyon. Michael, your line's open. I'll give you just a couple more seconds to unmute. The button should be on your lower um, right-hand side. Okay, we'll, we'll loop back around. Christopher Langston. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, I appreciate everybody's efforts in this very difficult situation and as one of the funders of the uh, process at the, from the Archstone Foundation, um, I'm very grateful to the, everybody uh, for their continuing participation in these difficult circumstances. Um, one of the things that I've been raising uh, over the process that I think is particularly useful potentially now is uh, the ability that we have if we work together and work coherently to draw down more federal money under existing law. Um, so I think a, a new revenue source, not um, from taxes, but from Medicare itself. So th as an example, the complex chronic care management benefit is something that uh, physicians and other healthcare providers who are working in, under Medicare can uh, bill and can use as contract partners for the delivery of these services, uh, community-based organizations, uh, and bring as much as a billion dollars to California to help address things like disparities, the complex um, chronic, uh, chronic health problems of older adults, and potentially be another way of keeping them out of long-term care facilities and out of hospitals and other expensive and unpleasant um, circumstances. It would require support from the state for technical assistance, presumably also for legal assistance because the appropriate use of these kinds of codes is very unclear um, and somewhat frightening to providers. But if the state were to really encourage somewhere between a mandate and, and ask the healthcare uh, delivery system to, to fully use these mm -hmm. kinds of uh, benefits under Medicare, we could bring a lot of money and pay for a lot of services without having to raise taxes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael, it looks like you've, you're unmuted, so go ahead and jump in. Yes, we're facing the worst economic crisis since the 1930s Great Depression, and at the same time, a once in a lifetime public health emergency. Trying to proceed by simply cutting medical and social programs to match lower revenues will kill many people, particularly in vulnerable and disadvantaged population. Who can predict what social unrest will result when people are finally fed up with the transfer of wealth from poor to the rich? 
and the lack of care from the government. New revenue must be raised from those who are most able to pay. Low hanging fruit will not do. The tree must be shaken and shaken hard. Full throated support of communities and schools and communities first in 2020 and a wealth tax and an oil severance tax would be a start. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, and at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Kim. Thank you to all of you. We have still close to 211 people who are with us, uh, the public, the stakeholders, the governor's office. Uh, thank you so much for this comment. I will sum up with what I hear are three uh, areas where next steps are needed. Uh, first, as Susan said, the LTSS report transmission. We will work with you, Susan, to make sure that goes to Secretary Galley, the governor, and the entire cabinet work group, as you said. Second, and I think very importantly, uh, you all surfaced something that I've uh, come to, uh, I could, I, I'll try to frame as there's been a rupture and there's a need for repair, uh, a framework from relationship. Uh, and specifically the crisis care, the digital draft, and the uh, many of the budget proposals uh, have caused uh, that feeling of rupture in the partnership. Despite the shared commitment to the people of California, the shared commitment to uh, this project, there is a rupture that needs repair. And I am, uh, can tell you that there will be uh, crisis care guidelines revisions that some of you have worked on and advised on should be public within coming days, which I hope will be a step on that path to repair. Uh, and then I'm uh, uh, optimistic that working with the governor's office, we can find a time to have that important budget conversation uh, uh, shortly and have more information about that too. So uh, hear you and hear the need for a way forward on those areas. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, of course, we will, we owe you a new timeline and we will work on that, that both adjusts for the pause, adjusts for the ongoing impacts of Corona, incorporates the uh, Alzheimer's alignment incorporates the long-term care benefit um, uh, report coming from Millman uh, and reports incorporates the long-term care at home benefit concept from DHCS. Uh, so more to come on what a practical and uh, effective timeline for this project is. Um, but with that, I think that's where we'll lend the report transmission immediately, uh, more soon on, on uh, moving forward with our partnership and then again, a timeline to get back to work in, in coming days and weeks. As always, please send us your feedback in all the channels we wanna hear from you. Uh, don't let us being physically separated make us socially separated. It's more important than ever that we pull together uh, and pull in the same direction. And I'm so grateful for our partnership through Thick and Thin. Thank you so much, be well. And we so appreciate your leadership. I just wanna say, we really, really do, Kim. Thank you, thank you. It's two way for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Kim.